Can you hear me? Uh, Mike, can you hear me? No. <laughs> 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 yeah. Michael, can you hear me? Come in, Michael. Come in. Mike, come in. Wait. Mike, Mike. There you go. Scotty, Scotty. Scotty. Are you? Push that middle button, Mason. I can hear you now. Hi. Okay, Michael, deliver your line. I come from the net. <laughs> um, if you want to lower the camera so I can see everybody. Hey there, hey everybody, how are you? Okay, let's bring this thing to order. Um, this is the reboot panel, in case you're in the wrong room. Um, my name's Gavin Blair, I'm one of the guys who created the show. And I know for a fact you're not here to hear from me today. So, uh, yes. I will, without further ado, I'm just going to go down the line. And if I get anybody's name wrong, I'm sorry. Because uh, <laughs> I'm very nervous. Um, okay, starting immediately here to my left. Mr. Michael Donovan, who is the voice of Mike the TV. And Cecil, amongst others. I mean, all of these guys and girls did multiple voices, but uh, yeah. I'll just introduce them with their main voices, and then I'll pass the mic off and we'll get on with it. Uh, coming next, in a very rare Oops. convention <laughs> appearance, is the lovely Shirley Milner. The voice of Hexadecimal. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Gary Chalk, the voice amongst others of... I always get them wrong. Hack. Hack. No! Slash. No. Slash. 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 The blue one. Cyrus Yes. Who's next in line then? It's Mr. Ian Collette, voice of Glitch Bomb. And then, the divine, Sharon Alexander, voice of Grown Up Andrea. And a hunky partner, Mr. Paul Dodson, voice of Matrix. Last but definitely not least, the voice of all the other members of the cast. Um, Scott McNeil, voice of Hack and uh, was it Specky Bino and Fax Modem. And Fax yes, absolutely. And of course, joining us through the miracle of technology on the big screen is the voice of original Bob, Mr. Michael Benye in LA. Okay, now I, I never have a plan for any of these panels because it's usually just me rabbiting on about the past. But um, what I'm going to do, I think, is just pass the microphone along and maybe everybody can chip in with a little anecdote or a story perhaps about Reboot. We'll start with the grown-up Mr. Michael Donovan. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> this is uh, the second one I've, of these conventions I've attended, so please be gentle on any questions that you have. Uh, I was uh, also the voice director for it. Show. So I got to work with all these guys on the other side of the... Is that Lee Tolkar down there? Hi, Lee. Tolkar. Hello. Hey, Plus, I want to say, hey, hey uh, Michael Benyer, how are you? Hey, hey, there. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. I can't see you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, do we, uh, should we just open it up for questions? I mean, or just... Uh, uh, okay. no. Can you see us now, Mike? <laughs> no? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Camera's over here, dude! Gary's going on a left. Gary's going on a left. Gary's going on a 
I'm over here. My one is over here. Over here. Oh, here. Oh, here. Gary, what's up, buddy? I wish I was there for the play. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure all you Reboot fans out there have a question as well. And this is for you, Gavin. Because the thing about Reboot that I found that was fantastic, it was one of the first, I think, if not the first, computer-generated image cartoon series. And uh, it came out even before Toy Story. Toy Story. The Toy Story was going on about how fabulous it was, and, and it was. But I would want to know, how long, or how many man-hours Per episode, did it take to build an episode of Reboot? Great question. Well done, Gary. Yeah. Goodness me. Well, the first episode, because we had to build all the sets, the props, the models, etc., 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 took about nine months. But then the second episode took about three months, and then we got better and better and better at what we were doing. So in the end, when the machine was rolling, it took about eight weeks per episode from, from recording the script to out the door finished wow. cartoon. Eight weeks. This is one thing I've always wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, now you know. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to chip in with something before we start with questions? Mike, you want to say anything over there? <laughs> We've lost Mike again. Oh, me? You're <laughs> me. <laughs> I forgot my question. Mike, Mike, yeah. my question to you, Gavin, is did you think 15 years ago that you'd be sitting there on a panel talking about a reboot? No, never in a million years. Well, congratulations to you. Thank you. I gotta say, uh, I've done, this is my fourth convention, and I mean, Reboot was so long ago, and it was such a, I mean, it was a big success, but in a small way, kind of thing. And everywhere I go, I am gobsmacked, which is an English expression, um, by the love and the passion for the show from you guys out there, and like, no end of people walk by the booth and sort of do a double take and go, oh my god, Reboot, I remember Reboot, oh, I watched it when I was four. <laughs> and I feel really old. <laughs> but, but no, there's a definite love and a passion for the show, and, and it blows me away every time. And the show, I've got to say this, I know it's schmaltzy and, and everything, but um, you can write the best scripts, you can write, you can build the best models, you can write, you can have the best directors, da da da. If you don't have the right voices for the characters, the show won't work. And these people here were the right voices for those characters, and they brought them all to life. And I am, will be eternally grateful to these guys for what we produced. So, a uh, big round of applause for these guys. one of them to say something at least, because I know you guys, I mean, I brought a phone book, we could get them to read the phone book in the voice of their characters. But I know you guys just want to hear these people say stuff, so um, maybe we should, do you want to say Well, I just want to tell you that when I first uh, uh, came to the show, I wasn't the voice director, I was just an actor. So, <clears throat> a real quick story, um, I had uh, shown up for the cast, casting, and we were all there, and, um, I had all the sides, which is all the stuff for us to read for, for the audition. So I thought, well, I'll do, I'll do Fong and I'll do whatever. And, then, and whoever's doing the casting, I can't remember who it was, <clears throat> he says, uh, no, we, we, we're not going to get you to read for Fong because we're going to get a real oriental fellow <laughs> to read for Fong. And I went, oh, okay, that's fine. So then I, I read from like the TV, I read for Hack and Slash and a bunch of other characters. So then I got my agent called, she says, you got to call back on Reboot. Went, oh, good. So I took that, I felt real good about Mike the TV, so I took the script, the original script, and I rewrote it. Because he's in television, right? <clears throat> and, and it was just like somebody changing the channels. And the script it was kind of thin and everything, so then I did things like I sang the theme from The Love Boat. I did a, I did a, um, a soap opera. I added a bunch of stuff. I like rewrote it, you know, rewrote it. So then I get to the, to the audition, on the callback, and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I looked at my name, and, Says Michael Donovan is Fong. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So I went, whoa, 
I didn't read for fun. They said, yeah, well, we tried some oriental people, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> okay, so then I read for the fun, but I says, well, I like I like the TV. And they went, yeah, it was okay, but uh, you know what? I said, well, I rewrote it. Oh, okay, well then we'll, we'll get you to lay something down. So then I did that, so. And it worked, so. Ah, yes, my son. You must have a good backspin. <laughs> He's got space, and even poor match Julianne Fries, but wait, there's more. And act now, and we'll torture the handy logomatic absolutely free for only... That it, I did this, he said it's not the French later, but uh, the other the other one was the, the guy who only had one line all the time. And, 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 so, you know, so Gary would say, which <laughs> what? <laughs> no, 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 you were Al's waiter, I was Al. You were Al's waiter. Yeah. And what did I say? You sounded like, hey Al. Oh that another. guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh okay. I, I'm sorry I've forgotten this character. <laughs> and it was, at the time, it was state-of-the-art. These days, you'd be better off using a cell phone. But, uh, and that machine, we became convinced that that machine was alive. Because if you sat there and animated, and then you got your shots ready, and then you set your shots rendering, and you sat and watched them render, everything was fine. But as soon as you tried to leave the room, the machine would crash. <laughs> And you'd come back in and you'd restart it and set it going and watch it for half an hour. It's like, oh, it's fine. Okay, let's go out and get some sleep or some coffee or whatever. And we'd leave the room, come back, and the machine had crashed as soon as we walked out the door. <laughs> and we were convinced that there was something alive and chaotic about that machine. So when later we created the Queen of Chaos, um, you know, she was basically the FGS machine that we'd done the ice cream so because she was, you know, she was crazy and she loved company and she wouldn't let anybody leave. She wanted, you know. So the relationship with Bob, between Bob and Hex was very much like the relationship between us and the FGS machine. <laughs> okay, I want to get some of the guys and girls down the other end to say things. So maybe we could have a question for someone. Anybody got a question? Question? Or there just a one. request for somebody to say something in a voice. Did you catch that? When you play more than one character, do they sound the same to you? I'm going to hand the mic to Scott McNeil for this one. That was... There's actually only one voice. It's all just done electronically and manipulated. <laughs> and everything sounds the same in my head. Um, that's a sick... I got about... so many voices in my head at any given time. The trick in my world is trying to figure out 
Which one sounds like my voice? Scott, you don't know what you sound like. I don't know what I sound like, but apparently there's people in L.A. that can do me perfectly, so... <laughs> the question would be, no, every character is you have to create it from another you know, spot, but the voice shouldn't sound the same. Hopefully not. No. Yeah. Sometimes there, are, there were similarities I would find with certain characters that uh, I've played before. And you get a lot of a lot of like the, the binomes and all them running around and so you've gotta ca you gotta cover all those things, you know, like you would have Matrix in the back going, This isn't mainframe, it's never mainframe. Why can't we ever get back? And what is it with you and guys on bikes? <laughs> <laughs> and then next thing you know you have like a little binome coming through Oh my goodness. I don't believe my eyes. <laughs> and so you try to make them as different as possible. But yeah, sometimes I mean, when, if you've gathered a whole bunch of them during an episode or something, or if you're doing back-to-back -back episodes, sometimes there could be a little bit of similarity. But you guys don't notice that, do you? Come on. It's all the eyes, dear boy. It's all the eyes. They're drawn differently, so they must sound. <laughs> so come on, questions, questions. We require we more questions. There's one. Well, one thing I noticed with uh, Reboot, we started uh, when we were changing. Do people still, when new people come in, do they still catch those parodies that you come to? I think for sure people noticed the evolution of the show as it was going along, definitely. I mean, like even, even just the, the animation itself. I remember when uh, new episodes would come and you guys were using higher grade technology, the colors and everything that was, it was just popping off the screen and it was becoming more and more like more than a television show, more like a movie. You know, and, and it was it was fantastic. I remember you sitting us down and us watching episodes of what you guys had rendered, and holy, you know what? It was just we'd, we'd be sitting there just going, "Wow, look at this!" And I think I think it holds up great. I mean, it's it's still playing on retro retro tele too. Yes, you know, we are. I know, it makes you feel so old, you know. Like you. <laughs> when I was watching the show, I was I was three years old. Yeah, you just like, oh. God, and the now. <laughs> it, and yeah, it's it sort of makes you feel decrepit, but uh, I think I think the, the show holds up fantastically well. Yeah. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. You guys want to hear this? Do you think this is? We gotta make sure he's got a microphone so you can hear him. Yes, I am not a voice actor, so I can't project like these guys. Um, what was that saying? Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of you guys and girls are, are too young to get a lot of the references that we put in there in like 94. So, uh, but I think you tend to get it, don't you? Yeah. So, and, and I mean, a lot. I get a lot of people going, you know, I watched it when I was four and I thought it was colourful and bright and I loved it and I was entranced by it. Then I watched it when I was 12 or 14 and now I get the jokes and I understand that joke now. And, that's not unlike, you know, classic Warner Brothers stuff, or, you know, any stuff, you know, you can watch it at any given age, and I don't think, I really don't think this stuff doesn't age, you know, I remember as a kid watching Looney Tunes stuff, Bugs Bunny cartoons, and they were making some World War references, true, yeah. and I got it. What's interesting is all of the stuff that these guys did in the background. <clears throat> and one of the, yeah, one of the episodes, I can't remember which one it was, but there's this, there's that outside scene, of, uh, of a street. I mean, it's the, I think they're in Dot's Diner. And there's cars going back and forth. And this big moving truck goes by. And I had to stop it when I had it on video. It's like two small sprites with big CPUs <laughs> on the side of a moving van. I thought, what a great idea, you guys. Well, explain that to the people who are Yeah, we have a, a movie company, big, two small men with big hearts. So it was two small sprites with big CPUs. Oh, with big heads! No, that's a different... <laughs> anyway, I just said... Ian, say something. Yeah, Ian. Hi. <laughs> um, I always felt like an intruder on Reboot uh, because the rest of the cast treated me poorly. Uh, they were not welcoming and, and I would get death threats from Michael Benio. <laughs> Uh, 
it's, it is true. Every cast I'm in, I am treated poorly, and I, uh, I try to reciprocate. Oh, God, and that's there, a long way. That's his wife telling me not to believe a word he says. Gary's phone always went off in session. He did the same thing. Or, or actually, he would often take a call in session. Just hang on just for a second. I'm recording. Oh, what? Really? Oh. Oh, well, I can be there at three. Uh, that was her. She was telling me to, to not believe anything that you said. <laughs> and we all love you, Ian Corlett. Because I gotta tell you, Ian Corlett, Ian James Corlett, and Michael, yeah, we love you, Michael. You know that, don't you? Yeah, but then say something for crying out loud. But well, I gotta tell you, Ian Corlett, he probably. <laughs> that Ian had replaced the character until the show was airing. I mean, I, no one ever told me. Um, now they have the microphone. I just want to share an anecdote with you. Um, doing a reboot, you, you know, being a voice actor, as many as you can attest, you, no one knows that you're this character, and it's very popular. And um, I was doing uh, movies in the States and back and forth, and I'd flown back to Vancouver to do a film. Um, and the movie was with Joe Mantegna, a movie called Underworld, not the one about the vampires and all that, it was a mob movie. So I'm sitting in a limousine set with Joe Mantegna for about a week, six days, and we're talking about LA and back and forth, and I said, um, I do voiceover, I'm back here uh, doing a cartoon, and I do a cartoon in LA, and back and forth, and he said, do you know Andrea Romano? And I said, uh, yes I do actually, she is the woman who cast the show that I'm doing in Vancouver called Reboot, and he talks and looks at me and says, Reboot? What do you do on Reboot? <laughs> I say, um, I do the character of Bob, and he says, Bob? Bob, Bob, on Reboot? And I said, yes. Are you familiar with it? He said, Michael, I have a six-year-old daughter. She's autistic, and for weeks, she's been saying, Reboot, Reboot, Reboot. <laughs> So finally, one morning, I come down and see what she's pointing at, and it's reboot. And then he looks at me, and he says, Wait till I tell my wife I met Bob from reboot. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you never know where the, you know, the show is going to take you or whatever. And one other before I don't have the microphone. Uh, <laughs> many of you know the, the line um, when Bob says something and he says, I don't think so. Do you know that? Yeah. Uh, it was in the original script, and when I originally read it, it reminded me of a song uh, from LL Cool J in the, in the 80s called uh, Going Back to Cali. And in the song, he says, Going Back to Cali, Going Back to Cali. Uh, no, I don't think so. So about two months ago, I happened to be at an event in Los Angeles, and I meet LL Cool J. <laughs> And I said to him, I just want to tell you this, I have no idea if you know this, I did this cartoon in Canada years ago called Reboot, and I had an expression where I said, I don't think so, and it was a reference to your, uh, to your song, uh, going back to Callan. He looked at me, he's like, lick it, lick it, he does it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> All right. So, inspiration comes from the strangest places. <laughs> well done. No, as I was saying, uh, uh, Ian Corlett, uh, we love we love Michael Benyar and, and and always will and always have because he's a fabulous guy. And, well, I like him because he's my friend, and we all like him. Anyway, but Ian here, I I really like Ian, and, and contrary to popular belief, Ian is very well respected and well loved in this community, except by some people. By his mom. Oh yeah, except by mom. Well, back, back in, in the early what would have been in '89, Gary and Ian and myself were in a cartoon show on NBC called Captain N the Game. Oh my God. Oh my God. Dr. Wiley, oh, yeah. King Hippo, <laughs> and I played the eggplant wizard. Look <laughs> <laughs> at Dr. Wiley. I can do Dr. Wiley. <laughs> Except it makes me wheeze. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a decent! Come on, eggplant! <laughs> <laughs>
Let's get to it. I didn't do it. It was all his fault. Mother Green. How many people out here know that uh, that all of Hack and Slash's dialogue was improvised? I do. Do it now. <laughs> Huh? On this show. Oh yeah, what about Buttons? Remember Buttons? The, 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 was that, the, that was the dog, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I gotta tell you, Scott, I gotta confess that I have, for all these years, thought I was the blue guy. <laughs> and I always thought the blue guy was named Hack. You are the guy, Slash. And I'm Slash. So. You're blue. And I'm blue, but I am, so I got half of it right. <laughs> so I'm only a halfway. <laughs> right, okay. Well, anyway, so Scott and I would go into the, into the studio, and we'd get the script, and we'd read it through the proper way of the script, and then we'd just riff on it. And it would go like this. Hack, I don't want to push the button. I don't want to push the button either because I don't have a freaking microphone. Oh. <laughs> you think for reboot there'd be two mics? Yeah. Yeah, there, there is. There's another mic sitting right there. there. And it's being unused. So they would let us go. We would do the yes, be very staid and official scripted version. And they'd go, yeah. okay, you guys just go. Boom. <laughs> I got the door with the push the button. You have to push the button. I don't want to push the button. You have to push the button last time. You're going to have to push the button. Something bad happened. There's something bad to me. Oh, my God. I'm going to kill us. Mom always liked you best. You fool me. Me in every single session too. I just kind of sat there with my jaw on the floor. Uh, Reboot was my very first cartoon and I had done TV before and Gary actually said to me one day, I'm doing this cartoon and they're looking for a grown-up Andrea and I think that you would have a good voice. Of course I got very excited and I said I've never done this, I have no idea how to do this. He's like I can get you in, just he's like come over I'll teach you. And I remember going and putting something down on a cassette sitting tape. In my basement. Sitting in your basement. Sitting on a nap in your basement. Come here, little girl. <laughs> you know we're on the show all the time, aren't we? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, that's how I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still close and together. One of Hollywood's most successful guys. <laughs> successful love stories. No, I, I never forget that. I, I, I'll speak without them. Like, can you hear me back there? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You can? Oh, of course you can, you liar! <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, I remember that with, uh, with Sharon, and, and, and I, I listened to Sharon's voice, and she had this great voice that was perfect oh, yeah. for Andrea. And I'm going, you've got to come and read for this. Oh, I don't know. Come on. And so we went down to, our ba to my basement. And I, I, I sucked. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Suck for a very short while. <laughs> He's just feeling jealous. Nothing a little blue pill couldn't have taken care of. <laughs> they, Gary was a very big help, and I did eventually get a job, and if it wasn't for Mr. Donovan, I don't know how long I would have lasted either. That's Everybody wrong. there was so patient. Oh, you were and so kind, and I wanted, I was, I was so intimidated by everybody and scared, and you still scare me. <laughs> Ian, Ian, this is what, these guys are so talented, there's so much talent, and Ian was always so official and so quiet, and he was always on his, I don't even think there was Crackberry then, but what? he was on his cell phone and doing this and doing that, and he wasn't paying attention, he'd sit down and he'd read, and suddenly like eight great voices would come out of him, and I was just floored by it, I was floored by it. And I always ended up next to you whenever I did a cartoon with you, I always ended up sitting next to you. It was a, a tip. And they'd be, and Gary, Gary was like the kind of actor who like, was waving his arms around everywhere and like spewing sandwiches while he was eating and dying over the mic and just hold on into it. And, every, and, and Scott is just like the most hyper. 
wonderful. <laughs> and it's, they're, just, they're, they're, they're great people, and it was just, I, I did my own voice, I had a great time, I learned so much, and I just, I'm really happy to be, have been a part of that show, and that's why I'm here. Um, and didn't she do a great job? Yeah. yeah. Never look at seashells the same way. <laughs> just just to, to build on what she was just saying, I, there's only a handful of shows that I've done of the hundreds or thousands, maybe hundreds of, of series, but thousands of episodes, that have had this kind of impact. And it's really, and I don't usually say this kind of stuff, as you guys know, um, it, it's really quite special to be a part of something that has had this kind of impact and has this kind of fan base for so long. So much of what we do feels very disposable. Like you do it and it goes on TV and then in a year or two, no one knows, no one even cares. And this is pretty neat. And you guys are, uh, are the reason why we, we keep doing this. So thanks very much. most enduring shows in my experience yep. traveling around is, you know, even in an anime con, I can be anywhere in the world, and people are like, you know, oh my god, so good. and somebody goes, you were a Beast Wars? No! <laughs> Beast Wars, we had uh, Scott over there who was everybody. Uh, uh, he was, uh, what was that? The Raptor one. Dinobot, Rat Trap, Waspinator, and Silverbolt. <laughs> and Silverbolt. Uh, Paul? Uh, I think he was in Beast Machines. Ah, Beast Machines. That's later on. Yeah, they're all the same. Obsidian and Tankor, they were great. We love those. Uh, Sharon, I don't think you have it. Ian is uh, Cheetor. Uh, I was Optimus Prime. And I was in L.A. Uh, oh, we're sorry. Mike was in L.A. Well, now I can share stories. Yeah! Uh, but do you mind if we talk about Beast Wars? No! Of course! Please! Is that alright? Beast Wars! I was stationed beside Gary. As Well, that's what we call it, because it's like the war. And Gary, as was mentioned earlier, he's a rather animated character as he's acting. And uh, I had to constantly be on the lookout for elbows and fingers and spit. Is that still down in his basement? Yes, and, and then of course the, the biggest thing was be wary of when he asks you to pull his finger. <laughs> Although I always did because it was just so much fun, especially when there was guests. And uh, they, they always enjoyed it and we, it was like, that was a long time we did that show. Like, several years, and it was constant. It, we felt like, I don't know, felt like a real job. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you something funny. Um, at the end of that, that show, um, Ian, being as thoughtful and kind, as generous as he is, gave me a can of Florient, which was an air freshener, Blade. or Glade freshener, air freshener, that I could carry into the studio with me. So, you know, when those times came, all the other people would be spared. But I only, I only induced it as a punishment when people got out of hand. I was like the policeman of the studio. I said, if you do, I'm going to let one. And um, I still have that can of Florian. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he hasn't used it yet. Oh. Yes. Anyway, it was, it was a real family kind of feeling in, in both of those shows. Uh, and, and again, those are the two biggest shows as far as audience impact and 
and ongoing audience interest that I've ever had anything to do with. So, again, thank you. Any, any other questions? I've got to be having some. There's one way out there with the guy with the eyeball. Yeah. Which purple GameCube came first? <laughs> Which one? Purple GameCube. <laughs> The, the first purple GameCube? Yeah. Uh, which came first? Yeah. That's a question for Gavin. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you mean what game came first? Or game whether two. we were ahead of um, Nintendo? Nintendo oh, we were first. <laughs> we were totally first. Yeah. Yeah. What was that, Mike? The reboot, number one. <laughs> really so by a number of years, I think we, we yeah, Game, I'm not sure when GameCube came out, but we were on air in '94, so no, we were way ahead of them. What was that? What was that? That's who we're missing right today. Is Kathleen Barr who played Dot, and she was also the voice of. She was the warning incoming game. Yes. She was the sister. We have a Dot. We do have a Dot. Could Dot stand up and go to toilet, maybe? That's a great costume. Wow. Yesterday she was a teenage dot. Yes. And I believe she has another dot in line for tomorrow as well. So. <laughs> Very good. Okay, another question, anyone? anyone? Glitch Bob. Uh, favorite line? Anybody has a favorite line? Oh, what? These guys? Yeah. Can they remember a favorite line, yeah. maybe? Yeah. Oh, I've got one. Hang on, hang on. Turn after these messages. <laughs> we now return to reboot. <laughs> and I don't think I got paid for that, so <laughs> can we talk? <laughs> Mine was, I don't want to push the button. Every time I push the button, something bad happens. <laughs> Mine was, uh, you're done. Here's your contract. <laughs> Question over here. Over again. We broke up with them first. <laughs> um, it was kind of a double-edged sword in a way because yes, one, you lose a broadcaster, which you kind of need. Um, but also, I mean, we used to fight with, not with ABC, let me get that straight. We used to fight with ABC's broadcast standards and practices, as you may be aware. Um, but then again, like I say, double-edged sword because quite often when they would object to something, it would make us get more creative about getting around it. I mean, just looking at Tiff Dot over there with the big gun. For example, in the Tiff, we wanted, she's playing a prison guard in a game, and we wanted them to be armed, we wanted them to have guns. So of course, the first thing ABC's broadcast hands and practice to say is, okay, they can have guns, but they can't shoot. <laughs> so, okay, well, there's the jeopardy out the window right there. Um, so what we did was, we made them shoot bubbles. So we got, we found a creative solution to a pain in the neck problem. And we used to do that a lot, I think. I... It was one that I remember, just one that I remember in particular, maybe you remember this episode. Um, 
he, somebody comes up with a gun, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Bob or, or Enzo, but they came down with this bazooka looking thing and they shoot this thing and a life raft came out. <laughs> it was an upside down life raft and it landed on them and on the side it said BSP approved. <laughs> and then the binoms or whatever who was were gonna run away from that. Yeah, that was it. So we'd have like, and, and I mean, I remember specifically on the TIFF thing where it's like, okay, they, they've got guns, they shoot bubbles, and Ian, I remember after we'd hung up the phone with BSB, Ian turned to me and he said, okay, just make the gun really big. <laughs> you know, so it's like, they've got guns, they shoot bubbles, but they're huge, and they go boom, 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 boom. So, uh, what was the question? Oh, so, yeah, the double-edged sword of, of um, so we no longer had BSB on our backs. But we didn't have a broadcaster, which is probably why the show disappeared for about two or three years. But then we got another broadcaster, and yes, when we started doing season three, and then later season four, we had complete control, and we didn't care anymore about BSP. Because let's face it, I mean, BSP are not, they always say they're there to protect the children. They're not there to protect the children, they're there to protect the network from getting sued. That's their job. They don't care about the kids. They just don't want kids jumping through plate glass windows and the network gets sued. So, yeah, it was nice to lose them and get that freedom to tell bigger stories and darker stories and, and go in different... I mean, we tried to keep the humour too, but it was nice to be able to go in darker directions and tell those bigger... You know, which is why we brought in these sort of four episode arcs, which build into a 16 episode big arc, and we tell a big story, but we also tell little stories as well. My favorite episode of the whole show was Enzo's birthday party. Now, yeah. 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 I remember yeah. sitting on my dad's floor and he's watching, what the hell are you watching? <laughs> the best show ever. And then Megabyte pulls out an electric guitar, but I guess yeah, this show's pretty good. Talent night. Yeah. Talent, yeah. Talent, yeah. Talent, Talent night, yeah. Now, did the voice actor for Dot actually sing that part at the end? Yes, she did. Fantastic. Yes. And Mike Donovan actually sang. I gotta tell you that story. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have that over to you. I forgot all about that. Yeah, on, in, in uh, I think it's called Cross Nodes. It's in the fourth season. And <clears throat> before the show even, you know, we were st sort of ramping up, getting the shows going again. And uh, Ian Pearson yeah. gave me a call. He said, uh, Mike, what you, can you come down and uh, I want to talk to you? And I said, okay, so I show up at the mainframe. And, hey, you were in the room, too? Yeah. yeah, okay, so they were all saying. So, <clears throat> Ian Pearson's kind of funny because when you go into his room, he's like this. He's pacing back and forth, back and forth. He's making me nervous. Gosh, an idea. Yeah, no, he says, he, says, he, says, he says, Mike, he says, uh, let me ask you a question. He says, uh, can you sing? <laughs> I said, what, now? Going <laughs> for your enjoyment? Is that why you call me now? He says, no, 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 no. Can Mike the TV sing? And I said, uh, yeah, I can sort of carry a tune. I said, I'm not a singer, but I can sing. I can do so. I says, what did you have in mind? And he says, well, the opening for the, I don't know if you guys remember the, the opening number, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it was the crossroads. So, yeah, the crossroads. So they got me in there and they had this temp track, kind of a background thing. They didn't have any of the vo other voices in there yet. And he says, okay, so it was like karaoke. So if you go in as a character, as long as you're in a character mode, I love doing that's way too much fun. So it's like, you know, stand at the crossroads, the crossroads, a huge celebrity, and that whole thing. And it was, I did it, I think I did it twice. Yeah. And on the second take, I went, great, great. I, said, I can do it again. You know, I can, I can do it a couple more times for it. So, no, no, that's good. So, it's, uh, and we don't see the show until after the recording. So, so we're not looking at it on the screen. It's, uh, we do all the recording and then they animate. So when I saw this intro, it's, it's phenomenal. They had this. Did you guys actually have a yeah, black yeah. a black background choir? We did. So, we got, Ian, uh, Ian actually said it was one of his best memories of the show because he he went into a recording studio with these three backing singers, like professional, big. They've sang with everybody. Uh, beautiful black, great voices. Choir doing the backing. It yeah. made Mike and, the TV sound so much better. And then he went into a studio <laughs> with Mike. Like the whitest guy in North America. <laughs> and he said it was hilarious. He loves that. He told me that. Yeah. James Brown going on in there too in that session. But uh, no, it was just, it. I, I didn't hear those background singers. I think they were going to put them in after. So it wasn't until I saw the show that I went, holy crap, this is good. 
<laughs> Fucking sing! But nobody ever called again. So. <laughs> oh yeah, we no. I, um, when we recorded her, we had the she, we had the track. I mean, she had the whole the whole sound. So she just got. I mean, Kathleen's a really exceptional talent, as all these guys are. Um, but she just had you know it was just so um, very sultry and. I mean, Kathleen has many sides to her, so she, I think she enjoyed doing that too. That's your note. That was a fun episode, uh, talent, just, just for all the things that happened in there. We had, uh, uh, I think one of the ones was they were into, or they were getting all the people to come. Living with BS and P. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but they, it was the one uh, uh, that was, uh, we did a William Shatner. <laughs> which is, which, and that, that was me, it was like, pack my bag, pack my pre fun zero, and then at the end, it's gonna be a long, long, Time. And he bows his head and his toupee fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys were just, it was just so great. Yeah. <laughs> it was here. Um, okay. No, way again, way back in the mists of the mid 80s, uh, we did the Dire Straits thing, which was the world's first computer generated pop promo. And that went down really well, and it was a big hit everywhere, and big on MTV and stuff. And Ian, I remember we were in the pub uh, immediately after doing that, <laughs> recovering from it, because that was three and a half weeks of hell doing that pop promo. And he turned to me and he said, hey, we could do a show like this. And I thought he was mad. But um, one hour got some sleep and felt better. Um, we started talking about it, and it's like one of the most uh, talking about the technology. I think Paul was talking about that technology earlier. Uh, back then, it was it, Reba was going to look like Dire Straits. So I don't know if you remember that pop promo, but all the characters were a bit cubic, they were no shininess, no shadows, very boxy, very very primitive. And that's what Reba would have looked like if we'd made the show right then in 1985. That's what it would have looked like. And very early on, somebody sort of looked at our early concepts and said, but it's going to look really weird, how do you explain that? And we sort of thought about it for a while and said, hang on a minute, if it's set inside a computer, nobody will care that it looks like that. They'll just <laughs> accept it. You know, if you look at the visual and go, oh, it looks really weird, and it's like, yeah, but that's inside a computer. They're like, oh, right, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that makes total sense. And that's the ball, the tiny snowball that started rolling and rolling. Of course, it took us nine years to sell the show to a network, by which time the computers had got better, the technology had got better. It no longer looked like that, it looked... Well, you, you, uh, let's get, well, let's get rock. Right. Point, where the kid with the bat that... That was basically, a, that was the prototype Enzo, and the way, Ian's way of testing the software. Cool. It was, you know, we talked to, um, SGI at the time about the machines and soft image about the software and you know trying to get you're trying to you always try and get something for nothing right um, it's like well you give us the machines we'll make the show then we'll pay you sort of thing um, and they're like oh, we're not sure about that and they're like okay well lend us like three machines and three sets of software to do this pop promo with and you'll get loads of credit and blah 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 and we'll get to test the stuff we're going to use on the show. So yeah, Def Leppard, Let's Get Rocked, was Ian did that on his own in LA. And not on his own, he had a couple of guys helping him, but um, that was very much the prototype for Reboot. That was, so that was how much we changed in nine years, where it had gone from Dire Straits to Def Leppard. And then very soon after that, we uh, started production on the show. Thanks for sticking with it. Thank you. We've <laughs> got a question for Somebody over here. What's the question? Oh, yeah, well, back there. Back there. Way back there. Uh, John. Uh, this is from Michael Benier. I know that you've done some voice work for Robot Chicken. <laughs> if you want, uh, if they need a reboot parody, would you want to come back as Bob and voice him in the parody? Did you hear that, Michael? No. Okay. <laughs> you've done some voice work on Robot Chicken. Yeah. Uh, if those guys wanted to do a reboot parody, would you be happy to do the voice? God, no. Who do they think they are? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, it'd be great. Cool. There's one right back here with the hat. Yeah. What was it like to work with uh, Long John Baldry? Uh, oh, okay, I've got to hand that over to these guys. Yeah, well, 
Um, he was great. Um, as a voice director, I got to work uh, directly with him. I'll just a real quick story about Long John. He was, um, and I apologize, Scott, for anything I'm going to say. No. <laughs> Scott is a wonderful individual, and he came in and did a temp track because we couldn't get Long John, and, and Scott voiced uh, is a Captain Capacitor. So Scott was nailing it, <laughs> like he always does. Uh, so the producer, the guy who was in the studio with me, he was named uh, Christopher Bruff. <clears throat> so Christopher Bruff is on over my shoulder. Just get him to read it. Just do this. Thing. Get him to read it like Scott. So <clears throat> he was kind of a prop like this. So I had the, I had this, the, the button down. And he says, just get him to do it like Scott McNeil did it. And it's also long shot, because we were like voicing now. Putting him in, and he goes, Who's Scott McNeil? <laughs> I said, He's the guy on the, on the temp track. That, oh, okay, well, I do it the way I do it. So, yeah, so that was, uh, he was a wonderful guy, though. We, we really enjoyed working with him. Yeah, amazing stories. Yeah. They were really positive. Yeah. Long John Baldry was a, an idol of mine. When I was used to be a, a young man, um, a rock and roller back in 1969-70. Yes, this guy, Long John Baldry, came out with this album, um, the, you know, Don't Try to Lay No Boogie Woogie on the King of Rock and Roll. It Ain't Easy, that was the album. If you ever hear it, it is fantastic. The opening monologue to that song is great. Yeah, that booja wooja music. But um, Baldry was such a, to, to my mind, a very humble, wonderful gentleman. I mean, he's a guy who discovered Rod Stewart uh, drunk, in a, drunk in a subway, singing at the top of his lungs when he was 16 years old. And Elton John, he had Elton John playing on his, uh, his album, discovered him. And he brought, he brought uh, Rod Stewart out of the subway in the 60s and says, you know, you could, you could be a rock star, you know. And sure enough, he was. And uh, I had the pleasure of working on a few series with him. And uh, the, the, uh, I think the funniest outtake was, uh, he was going, only the finest lubricants. What was that line? Uh, atomic uh, Hedgehog. Oh, so oh yeah, Sonic, Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. Yes, the finest of lubricants. He just cracked up at that. And, and he's a bit so funny. He was a very, <laughs> he was a very proper English gentleman. And I remember I used to drive him downtown after sessions every once in a while. And if you went one kilometer over 50 kilometers, John would sit in the car and he'd go, Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, oh, no. no. Oh, dear. What's wrong? Oh, it's, it's too fast. Oh, dear. I never gave him a ride. Uh, I used to give him a ride all the time. He's the greatest guy. He's like six foot seven. Any other questions? Someone back there? Yeah. Oh, where? Oh, sorry. I'll get you right next. He's got that big hand. Don't get tired. Always in hope. Always in hope. <laughs> no, getting the I role. Would, I would never wish. I mean, I, it's very black, you know, because because Tony J. Uh, Tony J. passed away last I think last year. Passed away. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe a couple of years ago, and I <laughs> in a dark moment, I went, yes, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and then the show. No, no, I'm kidding. I never. I would never think. He was also that the Boss Tiger on. Was it uh, Tailspin or Tailspin. on Tailspin? But I just remember doing, oh, what a delightful little tail sprite you are. <laughs> Exodusable. I just got a quick little story about Tony. I, was, <clears throat> I moved briefly about four years down to L.A. And uh, Tony did a lot of voice stuff other than cartoons. He did uh, commercials and things. So there was me and this other woman and Tony. <clears throat> and we're all in the studio waiting to get the producers online on the phone or whatever they were yeah. thing. So. We're all chatting amongst ourselves, because I knew Tony. 
He says, uh, Zoom Michael, he says, have you seen this copy? He says, this is he says, I'm gonna have to, once we do this, I'm gonna have to get to put it on my, on my reel. This is a lovely piece of whatever, this tripe or whatever. He's going, he's just ragging on this copy that we had. And the engineer comes in and he goes, uh, just hang on, I'm just gonna plug your headphones in. <laughs> you plug your headphones, we were live. <laughs> so the guys, the producers, whatever. And he went on and on, and I'm just kind of, yeah, going, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. No, I mean it. It's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going on his like, way, and it's like, yeah, <clears throat> it's well. <laughs> you know. Next one, right in the back. You had your hand up there in the back, girl. Yeah, there you go. I have a quick question. On the final episode of Reboot, I felt like it was the episode. I really like the whole musical. You get to the very end. Yes. 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 Guys, come up with that. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> The musical? <laughs> oh, the one that I wasn't in. <laughs> oh yeah, well, can somebody else talk about that? Yeah. That was the one that was... No, you guys were in. What? We were not in an episode? No. No, that was the, well, the musical number at the end of season three, which was uh, to the modern major general, Gilbert and Sullivan. Uh, yeah, no, that was one of the script writers, uh, he actually put in a spec script for the last episode of season three, which we didn't is that, use. Is that Marv Wolfman? No, no, no. I think Marv wrote the episode that we bolted the musical number on the end of, maybe. But before that, it was a spec script written by another writer whose name, sorry, escapes me. Uh, but the whole script was musical. I think I tapped oh, it. Wow. Yeah, maybe you did. <laughs> <laughs> she can't. But um, yeah, and it was like, no, we can't do an entire musical episode, but we liked the idea, so we got him to write the recap song at the end of the episode. Um, yeah, and we actually used, um, we got like our musical guy, Bob Buckley, got for, he got a couple of ladies and a couple of guys in who he worked with a lot who were operatic, because parts of it were operatic. We no. Oh. no. Oh, Gary probably could. Sorry, Gary. Not us. No. <laughs> okay, next question. Anyone over here? Um, I know that reboot right now is uh, the right CPD, right CPD, that this character to use, hard to find other than use copies anywhere. Do you know if, uh, are, if it's going to be reintroduced, say, for example, if I hit all four seasons? Yeah. And the second part of the question is, if it's cell phone enough, do you have any chance of a season five? Or <laughs> Okay, just very quickly, um, oh damn, I always mean to say this up front, um, just so you know, I am at the moment, at this time, not involved uh, with, I don't have anything to do with Reboot, because the rights are held by the company called Rainmaker, which used to be Mainframe, and is now Rainmaker, and they have the rights to the show, so it's entirely up to them what they do with it, and at the moment, myself and the other creators are not involved. So, this is, I'm only, I kind of know as much as you guys know. Um, as for the rights, there's a, there were rights issues with seasons one and two. Apparently a company, possibly Universal, I'm not sure, don't quote me on that, had a rights deal uh, with seasons one and two in perpetuity. So basically, if Rainmaker wanted to bring out a box set of DVDs, they would have to basically pay Universal, like, like I said, I think it's Universal, they'd have to pay them money, and I guess they'd only do that if they thought they could make that money back by selling the DVDs. Now, I know everybody here would buy it. Yeah. I know I would. But, uh, yeah. Um, I guess they're only going to do that if they think it's worth their while. Uh, what I was thinking was, if they do manage to re revive the series, which they are talking about doing with the reboot revival and, and all this kind of thing, um, if they did manage to revive the show in some shape or form, whether it be a movie or a series or a special or whatever, then it might be worth their while. This is just me, this isn't official, this is just me theorizing. Uh, then it might be worth their while to fork out the money to get the rights to do a box set which they would then use to sell the new season. So, but that's again just me guessing. Oh, I know. 
plot, when they are remastering seasons one and, one and two, uh, oh, apparently they are remastering seasons one and two. Now, by reformatting, do you mean? No, the old format is so old, and it's taking them a long time to do. They're, they're remastering, well, they're not, let me put it this way. They're transferring them on the high, but they have to transfer the tape. Okay. All right. Okay, well, that, that sounds like a hopeful sign, if it's true, but uh, you heard it here first, from that guy back there. Don't ask him how I know. I just wanted to know if Michael looked like he had something he really wanted to say. Oh, yeah, Michael, what was that? Oh, uh, it was about Tony J. Yes. Um, I don't know if any of the other actors actually met Tony. But when I was in Los Angeles, I did some of the uh, recording sessions, and he was there doing his lines first. And it was a pleasure to meet him. I think Mike Donovan also met him. He was about 6'5", and uh, had a Shakespearean tone about him, a British accent, which was authentic. And he sat when he recorded and smoked cigarettes. <laughs> so he would do three in a row of his line, he'd say, you know, I haven't felt this good since my first infection. I haven't felt this good since my first infection. I haven't felt this good since my first infection. And then he said, who wrote this shit? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, he was a great guy to meet, and uh, he was very proud of his association with the show as well, and he talked to me about maybe coming up to record in Vancouver, but I don't know if it ever transpired. No, Tony, I mean, Tony used to, in between, because the, sh the show kept dying, and then kept coming back three years later, and always in those periods, Tony would phone Ian uh, and sort of, you really should bring the show back, Ian. It's a very good show, you should do some more of those. Because uh, he was a big fan of the show, and he, he once he passed through town and he came to visit us at Mainframe and spent the day with him, and it was, uh, it was really nice. But yeah, he was a big fan of the show. Right there, you have the... Mouse! Mouse! Ever since I saw My Two Bobs, I've been wanting to ask this how much trouble with like censorship, censorship was, if any, did you guys get in for uh, Dot's bachelorette party? But that's the entire scene. Oh. <laughs> In My Two Bobs, there was a because they were getting ready for the wedding, and there was a there was Bob's bachelor party with <laughs> jelly and ice cream with, and juggling clowns, and there was um, yeah the girls' party with strippers and so on. Uh, no, I don't remember his. Like I said, season three and season four, we were no longer under the yoke of BSNP, so basically we were doing what the heck we wanted and getting away with it. Like, YTV complained actually about the size of Andrea's bra. <laughs> More than they complained about anything else. Actually, Andrea's bra, which they, if you watch, it was too small. If you watch that season, this fourth season, you will notice that Andrea's bra, from shot to shot, gets bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller. <laughs> Because what would happen was we, we built the model and we sent it to them for approval and they said, you've made the boobs bigger, and we'd go, no, we haven't made the boobs bigger. And they'd say, make the boobs smaller, and we'd make the boobs smaller and send it to them again. they go, the boobs are still too big. Okay, right, okay, next. okay, you've made a bra smaller. No, we have not made a bra smaller. So anyway, back and forth, back and forth. We finally have a finished model with the tech, because it's all textures, obviously, on the model. And we animate a scene with a whole bunch of shots in it. And they'd, walk, they'd send notes back and say, okay, shot one, shot two, okay, shot three, the bra's too small. Shot four, the bra's definitely too small. Shot five, okay, shot six, way too small. And it was the same bra and the same boobs, for goodness sake. So we'd, Corey, uh, one of the guys who worked on season four is in the room somewhere, maybe, put your hand up, Corey. There he is, right there, that's Corey Bada. I made, I made that guy's life hell because whenever there was a rendering error or whenever there was something like Andrea's bra, Corey was the supervising animator on that show. He had to fix the problem. And we were under huge deadlines trying to get the shows out the door and I'd sort of come, hey Corey, and he's like, oh, hey Gav. Like, okay, got a bunch of notes for you. Okay. So yeah, you'll notice Andrea's bra changes size from shot to shot. And sometimes there are like flames keyed in front of, if there's an explosion going on, there's flames keyed in front of her so you can't see her cleavage and things like that. So Andrea's 
They didn't care about the strippers. <laughs> they didn't care about the, the shit bridal shower, whatever it's called. They only cared about the size of Andre's bra and the size of Hexadecimal's bosoms. <laughs> and we, in the end, we'd had, we'd had enough of it, and we just went, ah, to hell with it. And we made both characters' boobs way bigger. <laughs> And then they sent us notes back, said, these boobs are too big! And we made the boobs smaller, and they said, okay, but we were like giggling because we knew they were now bigger than they were originally. <laughs> it's like, if you want to get away with something, push it out here, and they push it back, and it's already it's further than one, so... <laughs> and then you're wrong with the weapon. And then... <laughs> we have one way in the back. You laugh like hexadecimal. Okay, that's it. Okay. Excellent. I said, I said you'd have to do this. Hey! You're scary! closest was the girl who did the original Andrea voice, which was <laughs> Andrea Lippmann. Oh, little Andrea. Lippen. <clears throat> little Andrea. Yeah. She yeah. came in because she can do it French, kind of, and, and we had her, and it was like it was also very close. And then decisions were made, and they went the because uh, we we love doing. If you watch any of our shows that we have creative control of, we love to do a palette of colors, a palette of voices, a palette, a palette of characters. And we like all the voices to be, you know, different, unique. And yeah, Andrea did a lovely job. But it was like, well, no, that's French. That's an English girl doing a French accent. Let's get a French-Canadian girl who isn't doing an accent at all. So, so we, 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 we cast for a French-Canadian actress. So that is a real, her real accent. And, you know, there's different nuances to the phrasing. If you listen to what a quote-unquote genuine accent, rather than somebody putting on an accent, so yeah, it was, her name was Colombe de Mers, I believe. She was recorded separately. Yeah, she was recorded wherever you guys were done. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, what's interesting, a lot of people may not know, is uh, the characters of Mike the TV and Fong and those guys were recorded after, because I was in the session as the director, so we recorded and I would do some like mock up in the session and then have to go in after the show and do my lines. So when you hear them all together talking to each other, Fong, and Fong was never talking to the rest of the group. True. Uh, uh, oh. mm, sorry, one more. <laughs> um, that was, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Donald, Donald Gibson, which was Mel Gibson's brother. In, and we recorded him in Los Angeles. Um, and it's funny because Donald Gibson, if you ever watch any Mel Gibson movie, you will see Donald Gibson somewhere. He's got a bit of a, and he looks nothing like Mel Gibson, but sounds exactly like Mel Gibson. <laughs> it, was un, it was uncanny, and he was one of the nicest guys uh, that I'd ever worked with. But uh, yeah, we recorded him in LA. So. Those guys at the end make it way too Yeah, the yeah, guys are not saying that. Well, not great, Scott, but... Any questions yes, for Scott McNeil? Scott McNeil? Who would like to hear from Scott? Come on. Who on earth is Scott McNeil? <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello.
Josh and Kadir are going to get this one right here, a new one. Did you know from the very beginning that um, Nichols was going to be the dad in the first of the show? Oh, spoilers. Good question. Did we know from the Nichols was going to be Dolphin and the dad? Yeah. 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 I didn't know Nibbles was Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, come on, out with it. Nibbles. Um, nibbles. <laughs> nibbles. As you may, these guys don't even know this. The little squishy thing that Megabyte used to play with sometimes was a knoll called Nibbles. And we threw out breadcrumbs throughout the seasons where like Megabyte would squeeze in to make him squeak and he'd call him father and things like that. And it's all like, so the, all these guys were going, what did he just say? Did he say father? Yeah, so no, we, we, we sort of, when you're doing stuff like that, you throw out the breadcrumbs. You don't necessarily know where those breadcrumbs are going to lead you. You kind of have an idea, but you don't necessarily have an idea. And if you guys remember in later seasons, uh, Jelly Welly appeared, which was the, the man made of Nulls, who was Dot Nenzo's dad, because he was nullified in the explosion that destroyed the Twin City. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Dale Wilson did that. Dale was a guy uh, who. Who oh, is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm, was in the context of the show. <laughs> He's the man from Glad, Dale Wilson, yes. Um, he originally tried out for Megabyte, we ended up going with Tony. Uh, we, we then actually used him as fake Megabyte in, a, in an episode in season one. Uh, and we got him to really ham it up and, and do it really badly, like a really crappy impression of it. The one like, you fools, he's gone to the vid window. <laughs> and he did it all over the top. And then later, as a sort of reward for not using him for Megabyte and for treating him very shabbily, we, uh, we brought him back and used him as um, Dot Nenzo's dad. Yeah, so. Wow. Question. Yes. Oh, okay, you want to embarrass me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Sharon just asked me, well, you tell the story. All oh, right, okay. Um, Sharon's just reminded me that um, in season three, where Bob forces a restart of the system and he cause, they, cause the, they allow the system to crash and hope that there is a user and that the user will restart the system. And um, if you remember, there was uh, the, the, that's the closest we ever got to the user. A lot of people uh, gave us the business about the fact that in the opening monologue, Bob says, you know, they, they say the user lives outside the net and inputs games pleasure. I intend to find out. And a lot of people online, I've actually seen lines online going, Bob's a liar. Because <laughs> he said he was going to find out and he never did. What a liar. Uh, and it's like, uh, we didn't write that line. A guy in LA wrote that line and the network really liked it and we left it in. Um, but the closest we ever wanted to get to the user was in season three where the system crashes, the screen goes black, and then you get the typing, the tip tap, tip tap, tip, and it's like, you know, system crash, restart, question mark, yes. And it's like, oh, there is a user. Or at least that was what we were going for. And we did it, and we animated it, and we put it in the show, and we finished the show and everything, and then one day we're all watching the show back, viewing the show back, and we all sort of went, why didn't it say reboot? Yeah. <laughs> it was a head slap moment. Oh, reboot. Oh. simple one syllable name. These days if you watch TV it's Jack. All the heroes are called Jack. Jack, Jack Bauer, Jack O'Neill. Jack is the cool name these Jack days. 
Jack on lock, yes. We, we wanted Bob to have a simple, uh, one syllable name that was an everyman kind of name. Plus, the other half of the story is we were back in England at the time watching TV while we were creating the show and stuff. And Blackadder was on TV. You know the show Blackadder? And season two of Blackadder, the first episode of season two, uh, has a girl who dresses as a boy to become Blackadder's manservant and falls in love with him and yada yada yada. And she calls herself Bob. And we loved the way that Rowan Atkinson said Bob. You know, he did the, you know, so Bob. And we thought it was very funny. And we sort of saw that as karma because it was during, we were having this conversation about Bob's name. And that was on TV, and it just felt like karma. And we went, Bob, that's it, Bob. And it looks good, and people will think it means binary object and things like that. <laughs> and it doesn't, it's just Bob, it's just his name. <laughs> so, so there you go. Question. Question. Right there. Um, I think you asked Jillian Anderson to play Ada Nolly, or she did the X-Files Jillian, because obviously they were shooting, I'm just sitting down. Um, Julia, they were shooting the X-Files in town, obviously, and we found out through somebody, a friend of a friend or an agent or something like that, that Gillian Anderson was a big fan of the show. And so we got in touch with them and said, well, do you want to come and tour the studio and have a look around and say hello? And of course we were all like, oh my God, it's um, And I got to show it around and it was really cool. It was so exciting. Um, and while we were showing around, you know, we sort of, not wanting to miss an opportunity, we said, would you be at all interested in doing a voice on the show? And she's like, oh, I'd love to. So that was it, because as soon as she left the building, Ian and me and Phil are in the room going, okay, now we need to come up with a plot. <laughs> we, need get, we need to get Julian Anderson in the show. And that was where we came up with the whole, we, we actually had a writer who'd worked on the X-Files and loved Reboot, and he'd sent us a spec script, which I believe was called Trust No One, but the story was completely different. Um, but it was a great, X-Files parody, even though it was the wrong storyline. So we got that guy to write the episode, Trust No One, and put Gillian in it. And uh, she was, she loved doing it. Did you direct that one? No, all right, that's season two, I guess, yeah. So um, she loved doing it, she had a great time, she was a sweetheart to work with. And we said to her, do you think David would like to do, you know, the other half of the duo? And we got the message through to him and got back an emphatic, no, I'm not interested. So we got Scott to do a complete and utter piss take of David Dugan. Yeah. Quick look. So they went, okay, you know, well, you've seen the X-Files, we need you to do David Duchovny. And I went, I've never seen the X-Files. <laughs> and there was this, <gasps> And so I went and I got some and I watched it and I went and I do a lot of impressions and they're, you know, usually fairly broad. I watched and I went, how can you do that? He does nothing. <laughs> so I literally just stuck my nose in the microphone and was like, right, the aliens have taken this mistake. And that was how I played the whole show. It's just so like bad. The funny thing was a little quick offshoot for that when we were auditioning for Beast Wars lunch later and there was about 6,000 rounds of auditions for that show and we kept going through processes and processes coming back and call back and call back and then eventually we had to go in and meet with the, the executive types, the suits from the toy company and I was going, oh man, this is where all creativity goes out the window. So I had to call back for a couple of characters, and I'm waiting, and I go in, and sure enough, there's these very sort of officious-looking young men in suits, very Brooks Brothers and very buttoned-down. They're like, oh, uh, you know, thank you very much for coming in. We uh, very much enjoyed your auditions for... Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, so I did my auditions for Beast Wars, and they went, oh, by the way, um, <clears throat> you um, you worked on the reboot program, did you not? And I went, yeah, uh, I did, actually. They're like, oh, we have a question. Um, could you tell us who played the fax modem character on Reboot? I went, well, I can answer that. I went, yeah, it was me. And they went, dude, that was freaking you, man! That was the best thing ever! And the next day I got a phone call going, oh, you booked four characters on these Wars. <laughs> it is 
see they turned into like raving fanboys. They were like, they, they flipped. They loved that episode and the show. So. You never know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Say what? Are you talking about doing the voices? voice <clears throat> recording? Okay, okay, the basically the process of voice recording. <clears throat> I mean, we've worked together, all of us have worked together for years and years and years. But we show up for, for a show, everyone's got a script. We usually have, you know, ahead of time so we know what we're doing. Everyone highlights with these little highlighters. It's my line, my line, crap, you know. How <laughs> so, um, so uh, sometimes it all depends. You know, when we first started in this business, we used to rehearse. We used to go through the entire script through once just to get, you know, everybody used to it. But it seemed like the best stuff was the first stuff that you do. And then we say things like, yeah, yeah, Scott, no, it was great. Just do it like you did in rehearsal. <laughs> it's not yet, but it's gone. You know, it's like that moment was profoundly ADD actors. Here. Right. So, so we thought, you know what? We're recording, or not recording this. We're not recording the rehearsal. So why don't we just forget the rehearsal and do the show? So that's what we. That's what we. Do. So we just get. Is this a waste of time? You know. So basically, what we do is we go through and we do it in little scenes, little chunks, and we'll go through. Okay, this is like you know lines one to twenty, and we'll go through that little little sequence. And, uh, and then, yeah, okay, yeah, we're feeling good. It's uh, maybe a little quicker overall. Let's just do it again. So we do it again. And then maybe we come and say, maybe, okay, uh, yeah, uh, Paul, we want to get, you know, just pick up your, be a little stronger. He's farther away, blah, 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 blah. You just, it's very tedious. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find it tedious at all, Michael. I actually found that whole process of recording and taking all the funky bits out very enlightening and endearing. That's I lovely. Really <laughs> I don't buy that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed every moment of no, it. No, these guys are great. What? We recorded the very first uh, shows at a place called GGRP, which is uh, actually, no, it was called, um, what was it? They were Dick and Rogers. No, it wasn't Dick and Rogers. Rogers upstairs. But it was GG. It was GG. <laughs> Did we first? Uh, was the first? Are you first... talking like the building on Seventh and Columbia? Oh, yeah. The GRP now? I... Yeah. No, the one where. No, they were on Eighth Avenue upstairs. Okay. That was Dick and Rogers. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but the, uh, Dick and Rogers was here. Sorry, sorry. Dick and Rogers was here, and then GGRP, which is uh, Uptown Sound, it was called. Uptown, Uptown Sound. Sound. And Uptown My Sound was part of GGRP, and it was a big, huge recording studio. That's not even. I don't even know. There's somebody else in there now. <clears throat> this studio was one of the biggest actual rooms that I've ever been in in the studio. It was wonderful. It used to record brass band. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was huge. So yes, we, we recorded it there, which is no, no. And we did some stuff, I think. We did some stuff in Little Mountain. I think we did some stuff. Yeah. And, then Pine, and then Pinewood, which was downtown, which is no longer there, too. So go figure. Yeah, oh, five minutes. Maybe one more question. Oh, I've got two more. Oh, well, two more questions. There's one right there. Patient. And we have you. Oh no, sorry. It's you first, then you. Okay. Um, Thank you, Gary. Thanks. I'm the policeman. Yeah. With the, with the episode where the penguin makes an appearance, <laughs> Wallace and Gromit. Did you have any connections with the Wallace and Gromit creators? Okay. The, this is a question about the penguin from Wallace and Gromit, who made way too many appearances <laughs> in reboot. <laughs> the, when you're doing a show like reboot, um, you. It's like, if you do it once, it's a joke. If you do it twice, it's pushing the joke. If you do it four times, you're gonna get sued. <laughs> so, you know, we, we did a, a thing, there was a scene in, I think it was Identity Crisis, um, where we, we homaged a scene of, uh, from The Wrong Trousers, where Gromit's hiding in a box and looking through holes in the box, and, uh, and the penguin, we had the penguin walk by and look at him, just like he does in Rolls and Gromit, and walked out. And it was funny and everybody loved it and ha ha ha. And then what happened was the animators loved that penguin. So they'd be doing a scene and either the animator who was doing the scene or the director who was doing the show would go, put the penguin in the background. <laughs> so, so, and of course we the those guys would do that and we didn't know, you know, if I wasn't watching every shot in every show all the time, stuff got by me. And 
what would happen, usually happen, was we'd be sitting in Ian's office and we'd be watching the finished show back, and Ian would, Ian would go, why is the penguin in this show? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh god, and I'd go and tell that director or that animator, don't use the penguin again. And then like four shows later, the penguin would appear again. And, like, and it eventually, after the fourth time, like I say, four times, you're gonna get in trouble, twice if it's George Lucas, but four times if it's something like Wallace and Gromit. And at that point, Ian, I think, send out a, a loud, shouty page through the building saying, I want the penguin deleted. <laughs> so the penguin was deleted from the system and never appeared again. So. <laughs> Bit more, uh, in what way? It was a really crazy episode. It's one of our best, uh, I think, but it should be because it was animated twice. I don't know if you were on that one, or you were involved with that one. Because what happened with that one, and I'll try and be political about this, um, the director, we had an outside director in on that one, and he kind of ran with the idea, shall we say and he went off in all kinds of crazy directions and the show was way behind schedule and way over budget and way over length and had a bunch of stuff in it that it's like, where did this come from? It was crazy. And Ian actually had to take charge of that show and uh, move it down the playlist and actually basically redo the entire show. So it was kind of animated twice, which is why it's so good, because it's got so much work in it. It should look good, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, it was just an out there script and we had a lot of fun doing it. Well, I didn't have a lot of fun doing it, because it nearly gave, <laughs> nearly gave me a... nearly killed me, but, um, yeah. Oh, it is! I mean, it, it's, it's a big, it's a great episode, and it's a wonderful hexadecimal episode too, but uh, it should be, because it was done twice. <laughs> okay, last question, because I think we're getting the, uh, the... we're up for time here, so maybe one more! <laughs> okay. Yes? Uh, can we get Bob to do the whole intro? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Did you hear the question? No? No. Could you do the intro speech? I'll change it up a bit for you today. Okay. I come from LA. <laughs> um, through systems, cities, people, to this place. The animation convention in Vancouver, Canada, my hometown. <laughs> my mission to defend my friend against their enemy, something like that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Had a good time today. Thank you very much. Stay for Thank you, Michael. And I'd like to thank these wonderful people for being here. I believe some of them, or maybe all of them, are here again tomorrow. Uh, I believe there's an autograph session immediately following this. I'm not sure where it is. Downstairs, man, all in the dealer's room. In the dealer's room at 5, did you say? Yes. Oh, okay. 4.30. 4.30. Yeah. 4.30, dealer's room. These wonderful people will sign your books and paraphernalia. Thank you for coming.